you've been tracking legislative action for the past two years, then you already know that this floor, this place, this chamber, is where all the action is. There's a bottleneck in the process right here. It's where the most intense debates are taking place. So today, we're gonna go visit with the guy who sits up there, the guy with the big gavel, House Speaker Teller Balrock. We're not only gonna learn about the history of his office, he works right now where uh, Huey Long used to work. Uh, but we're also going to look at the regular session. We're going to look at the, the, the upcoming election year. We're going to talk about what Teller Barra is thinking about running for or not running for. But like everyone else in this building, from the fourth floor all the way down to the ground floor, Teller Barra is looking for capital gains. This episode was produced by LaPolitics.com and Ben Broussard Marketing and is sponsored by Chenier Energy, America's largest LNG exporter, providing U.S. energy around the world and jobs to Louisiana. A lot of people have offices at the Capitol, um, but you have something that, that a lot of folks don't, which is a little piece of history. This is the entrance to your office, but who used to? use this, uh, this space as as we this is the main floor of the capitol of course with the senate chamber and house chamber to our right and to our left um this at the time when the capitol was built was the governor's suite so um this was um, um huey long's office right after the capitol was built once huey left baton rouge and became senator in in, in washington um story has it he'd returned to, to visit here quite often and wasn't always approving of what was happening in Louisiana after he moved on to Washington. And it was at that point that he came to, to, to visit and had spent some time in the Senate apparently and was, was coming back to this area, um, I believe, to, to visit the, the now seated governor who was now in this office. And this is where the altercation happened with Dr. Weiss. Um, the shooting happened here at this door as he was reaching for the doorknob. Um, around this area of the hall, which you can see the, 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 the bullets, um, holes, and shavings there on the marble. Um, but just a, 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 you know, pictures and the things that have recounted it, it was a pretty crowded area here, and you know, ricocheting off a of marble and those kinds of things. There's a lot of history here at this door. Look, when I, I got elected in 2016 as the speaker, and we had some pretty contentious sessions that first year. Um, there were times where I'd put my hand on that door <laughs> thinking, maybe I need to go through the other door. <laughs> well, um, but it, it would come to mind every now and then. And there's history behind the door, too. There right? is history behind the door. Let's, uh, this is uh, kind of the, I guess you would call it the, the back door to now the, the speaker suite. Um, so um, my scheduler and um, assistant is here, um, my office here, but we've remodeled this a little bit once it became the speaker's office. So let me take you into what was Huey's office then. Um, and we can walk this way. So if you, if you swing around this way, um, Huey's desk, which is the piece of furniture that's in my office, I'll show it to you in a second, was here. Um, if, you, if you notice the, the carving there on the wall, um, a, a slight uh, screen behind it, there was actually um, a security guard in a chair that sat on that level um, overlooking Huey at his desk 24-7 or any time he was in the office. The access to that is limited, but there is still the security guard chair, um, newspapers from the 1930s, some cigarette butts still on that floor up there that's kind of preserved. Um, but, but the infamous uh, you know, voting board and switch, I've, I've been asked that question a lot since I've been in here. This was the House and Senate voting board um, before we had the big electronic board in the chamber, which you can see as members vote, um, this is kind of that version, but in this office. So, um, you know, there was apparently a switch that would turn this board off and on. Um, and, you know, I don't know how proven those stories are, but um, um, story has it that as he saw the red and green lights lighting up, if he wasn't certain he liked those results, um, the board would malfunction sometimes, either by accident or by him flipping the switch. Um, the board would go off, he'd go out on the floor, work his votes, um, come back, turn the machine back on, and they'd try again to see if they could get the vote right, apparently. Um, this was his office. That was a conference room. When we turned it into the speaker suite, um, uh, kind of chief of staff here and speaker in this office. So uh, the furniture in here was actually um, Huey's. So to the board that I was talking about earlier, this Huey's desk, actually, um, Huey's chair. So uh, a little humbling that I get to, to be a part of that. Um, but the switch, uh, and I won't climb under there for you now, 
But the switch uh, that we talk about is there in the, in the far right corner. It might be really hard to see with the light, but um, it still exists. Um, and, and, you know, there has been temptation for me to try it and see if it would work. Um, <laughs> during one of those special sessions, I was, I was hoping it was working. <laughs> So a little over two years ago, you became the first Speaker of the House to be elected without a uh, nod from the governor in, in modern history. Uh, you were an unexpected speaker, an unlikely speaker, a compromise speaker. Um, this far into it, we're halfway through the term now. Has it worked out? Has it played out like you had hoped? Yeah, I think it has. Uh, not, not without uh, a lot of growing pains and, you know, a, a, a pretty... Um, interesting deliberation amongst, uh, I think, getting our, our house body back together after that fall election in 2015. It was a pretty contentious governor's race, of course, and that led to, um, you know, Republican and Democrat candidates um, making their way around to, to potentially be elected speaker. So, you know, when, when it ends that way and it ends in a, a little bit different than what most of the body would have expected um, it to end, um, there's a little bit of healing that needed to happen in that first session and um, unfortunately we went immediately into special looking for two billion dollars and um, you know that that was not the most pleasant exercise as well so 2016 is probably a, a blur for the most part but i think the body has come a long way since then and i think a, a lot of growing pains come with with independence i mean this is not something that the, the body has been accustomed to you know since since i've been serving since 2008 um, you know, both of the speakers I served under were 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 selected and and chosen by the governor. So, you know, it, it, it's a different exercise for staff. I think it's a different exercise for the Senate to have a, a house that's independent from the governor. And I think it's it's a learning exercise and going through growing pains as as we go through it. But um, you know, is it the right thing to do? Certainly, it is. I mean, I, I don't think the administration. Um, you know, has any play in who's the Supreme Court Justice either in Louisiana. So those three separate branches of government were, were constitutionally separated. We do it in, in, you know, our country as well. So I think it's, it's the right exercise. I think for Louisiana it's a different exercise, but it's, it's come with some growing pains, there's no doubt. And I was going to ask you that. It's, 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 apparently this, this is what independence looks like, and I would imagine that ne next term uh, the Senate's going to be in a very similar position. I would think that could happen. You know, when, when I look at our, our senior members uh, that I came in with back in 2008, um, several of our third-termers have, you know, chosen to move on um, as opportunity occurred. We'll have an election this weekend that will could possibly lose another member um, to the mayor's race in Sulphur. So, um, you know, you have that change going on. A lot of those senior members are also considering runs at the, at the Senate for next year. So um, I, I, think, I think term limits... Um, independence, you know, this is a first, I would say, 12-year cycle of what a full-fledged term limit looks like because we were the, the class of 60 that came in in 2008 that replaced that first crop of, right. of big term limit exits. And I think, I think you're now seeing the full effect of that and, and you know, what that does with, with the party votes on each side of the, the you know, that, that swing looks like it will stay Republican in the House for a while until we'll see what happens with redistricting. But I think, you know, independence from a governor, um, not necessarily just this one, I think is, is something that will continue. And I do think you'll see that exercise in the Senate as well. So if we've learned anything over the past two years is that there's, a, there's an unmistakable bottleneck on the House side. Um, you know, if you really want to move something in this building, you, you got to get through the House. Seventy votes have proven difficult. Um, why is that? Well, and, and, and you know, mathematically, the numbers. Um, 61 Republicans, 40 Democrats, three independents. So, you know, on a, on, a, on a financial vote or anything that generates revenue or a fee that requires 70, neither party can do it alone. So, you know, uh, the biggest part of my job, I think, over the last uh, two and a half years has been that moderation of if, if, if this is something that we think we're going to move forward with and want to get 70 votes, then we've got to find the, the mix of Democrats and Republicans and independents that gets us that number. Um, that being said, you depending on the bill, you know whether it leaves committee or whether it leaves the floor, 
um, you know, you will likely not get all 40 Democrats. You will likely not get all 60 Republicans. Um, somewhere in the middle is a, 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 a 35 and 35 split that, that we work to find. And um, it is what I spent the most of my time doing through all of these special sessions, knowing that that would be the case. Because most of what we've heard in the special sessions has been revenue generation, which has been, you know, 90% of those bills required 70 votes. So. Um, that that is it's not an intended log jam, but I think by the sheer numbers, um, I mean we could have Republican authors on all of them. We can't pass them with 60 votes, you know. So it's it it's a it's a moderation of you know what can each side live with to get there. And I think I said this back in 16, right after I got elected, how the, how we solve the two billion from then to the billion now is going to have to be a combination of of some forms of revenue. Um, some goodness from the economy as we continue to improve, and certainly some appropriations reductions by the time we're done. So I think we're, we're nearing that exercise as we get through this session and, and possibly into another second special that, you know, we're at that crossroads. Is it, is it, is it revenue or is it appropriations reductions? And I think that's, that will be what's decided before we leave here in June. What, what number in terms of the, the shortfall, you know, we heard a billion dollars uh, from the administration in the special session. Uh, I think it's pretty clear to everyone it's no longer a billion dollars. Correct. Uh, 700 million seems to be the number that the kind of mainstream press is clinging to. Uh, the GOP chair, Lance Harris, has said 500. Um, what, 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 where, what's your, 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 your comfort level on all that? Well, and, and I think that, that that's an example of, of, you know, the different components that could take that, that shortfall downward. Um, is another de deliberation amongst um, amongst members of the of the body. I think if you if you look at you know current year um, the 18 budget that we're still in um, a, a surplus of 153 million. What what we ultimately decide to do with that could have a 150 million dollar effect on on next yeah. year's next year's um, goal. Um, if you if you spend it and it's recurring, then you've not helped the cliff. If you spend it on a one-time expense that could help the cliff next year, those the, it'll be those recommendations certainly that our appropriations committee will continue to work through. I think everyone has agreed that the the changes that the federal government made on personal income tax um, has a positive effect on on the fiscal cliff. Although mm -hmm. that means we're paying a little bit more in Louisiana income taxes, but. Um, from, from a fiscal cliff perspective, it was viewed as a, as a positive. Um, I hope that you know by mid-April we have a revenue estimating conference meeting. I plan to, to call one to, to, to have that our economists talk through their methodology at arriving at that number and hopefully adopt it that we can yeah. incorporate it going forward. And that could be in the neighborhood of maybe 300. 300, million. 300. So if, you know, to, to the different views of, of you take that 300, what do you do with the surplus from this year? Um, you know, you have a lot of statutory dedication um, um, discussion going on. You know, have to be a little bit careful with that. That could be one-time money, depending on how you do it and, and um, the funds that you take it from. Um, we also have a stat did review committee that's been meeting, and right. I know there's there's a bill awaiting possibly dormants, you know, ones that are not used that may be considered in a bill. So there's there's a several of those components that could could begin chipping away at that. That 700 to to you know to Lance's comments with regard to the 500, I think it's incorporating some of those possibilities as you get to that to that point. You know, in addition to 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 the Fed effect um, that we'd be considering in REC, I, I'm, I'm not anticipating that it will be a a large number, but you know, net collections that we have watched over the last 12 months, you know, have seen some positive improvement. I'm, I'm not sure it's. It's worthy of a, a revenue forecast change just yet, but I'll let the economists kind of give us their recommendations on that. You know, you have a little bit movement in, in oil price. It, it, it's pretty volatile changes, and I think the economists are a little bit more comfortable making that adjustment after it's averaged mm -hmm. for a while. I mean, it, you know, it doesn't change every time the price changes, but um, so I mean, I, that general barometer is moving in the right direction from a economic impact of all of our buckets of revenue. You know, does that translate into a, a significant revenue forecast change? Possibly small. I'm just not anticipating that being big. But anything that would be considered would certainly be an addition to that 300 that's out there. Um, do I think we completely cover it? Likely not. 
Um, what level is left open? You know, at this point, I would estimate in the, you know, the 200, 250 million dollar range. That's not spoken for at this point, but that that would be a better barometer to read, I think, after the REC meeting, um, which is one of the reasons I'd like to have it sooner than later, so that we can, you know, have all things in, considered when we um, attempt to pass uh, a House Bill one over to the Senate. And that's that's what I was going to ask you: is if if. Uh H, moving to HB one, the budget out, out of the house is that you want to you'd prefer to wait and see what the RSC does before yes. you send something I mean, over. Yes, on our calendar that we're using now, uh, from what I can estimate now, certainly by the the third week of April, we would have finished testimony. You know, been able to go through um, all of the departments at that point. Um, if the RSC meeting can be held, um, you know, right near that time. Um, and if our economists are, are available to do that, and I'm hoping they are, that, that we would be able to incorporate that as we send it over to the Senate. I think it's, a, it's the best starting point we can offer with an HB1. I don't know that, that we'll love it when we send it over. It's kind of hard to call at this point whether it gets 53 votes to send it over, depending on the level of, of revenue and cuts that are in it. Um, I think there's a possibility that gets over there that way, and it's a starting point for the discussion, no doubt. Um, you know, there's been some suggestion that we wait till May. I, I, I certainly don't think the 300 million number that the Fed's, um, that, that the economists are estimating the Fed effect is, changes in a month. I mean, that, we've been talking about that number since yeah. December and January. Um, so I don't think waiting a month helps any. And, and certainly, you know, the things that are big tickets on the REC are both personal and corporate income tax, and we won't have those numbers completed by May either. So. I, I think this is our best effort to get a bill moving, get it to the Senate. It may be one that, that, that is a starting point um, to, to have that discussion of the level of cuts that are included in it or, or you know, the level of revenue that's included in it as well. I think it's, it's a little early to call as we sit today, but I think it gets a lot more clarity following the REC. Yeah, you know, I mean, thinking about that, that timeline that you're laying out and Thinking about the the, the, the governor and, and the Senate president want to end the session early, I guess in mid to early May, um, that could create a you know a very kind of hectic closing weeks. Or I guess to start off with, or are, are, are you totally on on board with the idea of, of ending the regular session well, at that point? You know, it, it it's a it's a from a from a concept. Yeah, I'm 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 supportive of that. I think I think a date certain is what I have the most pause about, and that. Um, I lay out House Bill One aside. Um, you know, when I look at the the contentious type bills that we have, um, you know, gaming, gun bills. I mean, we we spent four and a half hours Monday afternoon on seventeen bills. I mean, I think the floor exercise on a lot of these bills is going to be quite time consuming. So, I'm, I'm, the concept of of giving us some time to do a special at the end is certainly acceptable to me. Um, with, with a couple of caveats, you know, if we need it, which there's a possibility we will, um, if we can get all of our work done in a, a timely manner, which we have escalated our schedule to, to try and get there. Um, but I think floor votes will be a little, a little, a little slower to come by. So, you know, to pick a date that I would agree to sign die is a little early for me to call at this point. I think once we have the RAC meeting and I see where House Bill 1 is going, we get a measure in April of where we are with bills on the general calendar. I would feel a little bit better about committing to a to a sine die date at that point. That's a little hard to call at this point. Yeah, and there there, there are just a wide variety of, of fascinating policy issues moving through the regular Absolutely. one. One of which is the constitutional convention. Correct. Uh, you're the co-author on uh, HB 500 by Neil Abramson, uh, which we we'll call a limited constitutional convention. Um, obviously, you're in support of it. You're a co-author. Correct. Um, is it, you, you think that bill has a has a even odds well, to get out of the house? Yeah, and I know there's there's different schools of thought as to whether you do you know a limited or a, a full blown um, opening up of the constitution. And I think I think where we are in in a, a funding of state government that it is a, a a financial exercise first. I think if I think when you open up the whole thing, which I'm not necessarily against at at a, a point in time. I think what we have now is an opportunity to determine the level of funding that we think we need to run our 20 state departments and state government as we sit in this economy now and, and match that up to what our revenue buckets look like. Um, you know, 
spending appropriation cuts, you know, trimming budgets will always be part of our appropriations exercise. I think what we need to determine is, is you know, what, what do we think in this, in this time frame is proper tax policy. We've made a lot of changes to, to corporate taxes over the years. We've just recently changed the industrial tax exemption versus inventory tax. Now companies have to make those decisions. So we've done some isolated things on a lot of our, our tax code. I think, I think funding, budget, spending is where the priority of the Constitution needs to be now, which is why I would tend to lean toward more of a support of a limited. Um, you know, how we fund locals. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a probably, you know, 50, 80 year exercise that needs a reevaluation, there's no doubt. Not, to, not in any way penalize the locals, but I think give locals the opportunity to play in how they raise their revenue as well, which I think they would welcome in, in, in that exercise. So I, th I think it's those parts of the Constitution that need immediate, immediate attention. You know, what we do with the rest of it as we go forward, um, I, I just think you have a lot of, of policies around the financial, budgeting, spending, revenue sides that need to be addressed first. You also have a number of gaming bills. It's the, there's a riverboat task force that came out with some recommendations, and it Correct. seems like that, that brought all aspects of the industry to the capital this year. The riverboats, mm -hmm. land-based casino, the racetracks. Um, what's, what's, what do you think is, is the outlook on the house side for some of those proposals? You know, it's, it's, it's an industry in Louisiana now. You know, 25 years ago it wasn't. It, it's, it's become an industry, and, and one from a financial perspective, um, you know, whether you love it or hate it, it is, it is part of our, our revenue source at, at, at this point in time. Um, you know, I carried the bill for the, the land-based casino. We did it in committee yesterday. Um, a tremendous economic development opportunity there. It, it of course, does not expand their, their gaming floor at all. It, it is all, all about entertainment, restaurant, tourism um, improvement, and also um, solidifying the contract that's about to expire. And, 2024, and and give the city, the state, and and Harris, for that matter, a a, a framework going forward as to what that long-term um, contract would look like. So, I think in what we passed yesterday, we'll certainly hear it on the floor next week. Um, is a is a great opportunity for the city of New Orleans. Certainly a great opportunity for Louisiana. Um, Harris has come to the table with with a a, a better contribution level. Um, and I think a better model for them as well with the new hotel coming on board and um, I think in the end uh, a win-win for, for Howard's and the state of Louisiana at, at the end of the day. You know, when you move into those, um, those options that either um, expand gaming space or allow a different version of, of betting, you know, you have fantasy sports and what you do with racetracks and what racetracks can include, those probably become a little more difficult vote. I mean, you know, as you look around how some of the local referendums went with video poker back in the day, my parish, um, you know, denied it twice. So I, I think it may come up again um, of, of recent, but our two neighboring parishes approved it. So um, you, you have that mix across the state of, you know, what level of support do you have for that kind of gaming activity? Um, and. You know, the horse racing industry has changed a good bit. A lot of them include, you know, gaming floors now. And, and to what level do you allow that to continue? So um, I think you have some, some, some moral concerns with, you know, what that does with safety and, um, you know, um, environments in those communities. Um, I think those become a little bit tougher votes, likely. Yeah, that there's no shortage of, of issues for you right now. In, in this session, <clears throat> and potentially maybe another special session, um, but looking ahead to, to the 2019 legislative year, you know, let's not forget we not only have elections, but I mean, we, there's another session coming Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Um, are, are there any issues that are kind of on the back burner that that may help define the 2019 legislative year? And, and I mean, where where do y'all go from here? Well, and you know, 2019 um, is is a fiscal session, and usually those fiscal sessions in election years can get kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you would think there'd be an opportunity to do a lot of fiscal change, and I think members get a little hesitant depending on you know what those recommendations are. I think we could use it um, depending on how this one finishes, um, with with cleanup and and possibly further adjusting um, some of the some of the decisions we make as a result of this session and 
and our second special um, as, as we, we work toward balancing the, the budget. So, um, you know, a fiscal session that, that may not be as robust as we've seen in the past, but I think an opportunity to, to continue to look at, at, at what we do financially. Um, you know, a, a lot of change. I mean, we will lose um, about uh, right at 40 members of the House to term limits um, in 19. Um, and, and, you know, judging at the, 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 the 23 that came in, in in 16 that were new members of the House um, who have hit the ground running, and a lot of them have been quite active in, um, in a lot of legislation, I think, you know, members that choose to run for the legislature now, um, I think, you know, compliments of social media and what has expanded as it relates to what we do every day in this building and you know, broadcasting committees and, and floor, floor um, work on the World Wide Web. Um, you have members that arrive here way more prepared than, than you would expect and, and you know, sleeves rolled up and, and ready to work, which is a, a good thing. Um, through, through my tenure, you know, we have added, you know, seven or eight new members since I've got, uh, since I've become speaker. So um, I think, I think that's, that's goodness for Louisiana. I think it speaks highly of the representation and the desire that folks have to still come and, and serve um, despite, you know, you being completely public. I mean, I, I, I can't leave that stand every afternoon without something on Twitter. So. <laughs> Um, it's uh, not that I get to participate in it while I'm working, but um, it's it's a it's 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 a different industry with social media added to it. But I think it's 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 changed the the, the environment of, of what we do. But I don't think it's harmed it in any way, you know. Other than a couple of my members may take shots at each other more than they should on social media, but we, we work around that. I'm well, talking talking about fresh uh, fresh blood. There's new leadership at the Louisiana Republican Party. Louis Garbage. Uh, is 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 new to the the job. He was elected. There's a new executive director, Andrew Bosch. Um, what have uh, the communications been like between the Republican delegation and the party? And are there any new new ideas about partnerships or anything that that have been sure. discussed? You know, I, I knew Lewis before um, him getting elected, and I'm certainly pleased to have him. You know, at at the at the realm there, and and hopefully. Um, you know, he, he's hit the ground running. In fact, um, he and Andrew uh, visited with me um, here at the Capitol last week, and I think they are, you know, engaged, um, certainly following what, what is happening here. Um, I think the, the State Central Committee, you know, is, is um, you know, sleeves rolled up, ready to assist where we can. Um, I, think, I think as we approach 19 and, and you have a, a census in 2020, um, both parties. I mean, I've, I've gotten those inquiries from the, the Democratic Party as well as it relates to, um, you know, structure and preliminary work done toward redistricting as we approach 19 as well. Um, that, that exercise is the next speakers to have, um, but not, not to say that there can't be some, some groundwork laid with preliminary work that you're able to do, but that's not a whole lot in 19 until you actually start getting census results in 20. But um, and then the, I actual, think, the actual redistricting session, I guess, would be 2021. 2021, right? correct, correct. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I think that that is, um, when I look back, I, I happened to be able to serve on the House of Government Affairs Committee for the previous eight years and was part of that redistricting process in 2010 and 2011. Um, an incredible exercise and, um, you know, with, especially with Louisiana's history of having to have preclearance with what we've done and to do that in 2011. and and be cleared on the first shot was an incredible um, opportunity for us and I think a step in the right direction for our state. So hopefully that continues in the 2021 range as well. Yeah, that, that was kind of my, my second to last topic to talk to you about was re redistricting. Um, you, you said that, that maybe there can be some, some groundwork, um, some prep work. Um, had there been specific discussions about doing something? Well, or, uh, you know, with, with, the, with the, House, the, the House and Governmental um, uh, Committee that we have in place now, um, in fact, the chairman now, Mike Danahe, was, was a eight-year member of the committee with me as well and was also part of that redistricting process. Um, so he's got the knowledge. Now, you know, if he gets elected mayor this weekend, we may not have him <laughs> for the rest of the session. But, um, you know, a number of those members have, have served. Um, of course, they've had these last four years on House and Governmental Affairs. Um, you know, unfortunately, in 2020, that speaker gets to assign a, a whole new House and Governmental Affairs committee. So 
Um, I think I think the what you can do from an education perspective um, is somewhat limited in 19, but not that you couldn't do some prep work. And certainly, if you if you have members that are interested in being part of that committee in 2020, um, let them have educational opportunity if they can in that 19 year, because there's a a good bit of a good bit of learning on on truly what the Department of Justice is expecting when you submit the plan and. I think the more members understand that clearly, um, it does help the process go a little quicker. Well, Speaker, you are term limited. Um, what, what's next for you? Because you, you could run for the Senate. I don't know if you've heard, Secretary of State. Looks like it's <laughs> going to be an open uh, job sure. next year. Our yep. last guest, Joel Roberto, I tried to get him to start a rumor that he was going to run for the third district. He wouldn't <laughs> bite. If you, if you want to start a rumor about Secretary of State, you running for that, we, oh, we can do wow. that here. Well, and, and, you know, it's probably the, uh, the question I get most often in the Capitol and back home. Um, you know, I, I, I quickly remind people that I'm, I'm, I'm not quite done with my banking career yet, but um, fortunately my, my bank um, senior management has been very supportive of what I've done here over the last 12 years and grateful to my Beery Bank family for that. But, uh, you know, not that I've had a whole lot of time to think about uh, what I do at the end of 19, but um, certainly you know, this is going to be a hard process for me to walk away from. There's no doubt about it. I, I have enjoyed the the last uh, 10 or 11 years, and certainly this experience as speaker has been incredible um, to, to work through. Um, you know, tough to walk away, whether I do something, you know, here or back home. Um, you know, I have uh, family to consider as well, expecting a first grandbaby in a month. Congratulations. Um, um, so we'll, we'll see how that all turns out by the end of 19. and you know, what my life looks like then, but. So a look, um, a, a, something you know, back in Iberia Parish could be. You know, that possibly. that's possible. You know, I've had a number of people, you know, talk to me about, you know, Secretary of State, um, certainly sitting on House and Governmental Affairs. Um, that's where all of the secretary and election code is, is held. So, you know, very familiar with, with um, Secretary Shedler and his team and um, the election code work that we've done over the last uh, eight years. So. You know, not not necessarily something that I'm not interested in, but I, that just wasn't on the radar until you know the last few weeks. But um, a lot of discussion, a lot of, of water to let go into the bridge as we get through these sessions. But uh, you know, well, politics well, it, certainly not out of the question. Where where that is, we'll have to wait and see. By so you're, you're, you're not ruling out Secretary of State. Then. I'm not ruling it out, but yeah, I have a lot lot to consider there. But, okay. Yeah. Well, hey, appreciate you making time. For absolutely, us today. absolutely. Thanks, Jeremy. That's it. That's a wrap for episode three of Capital Gains. Great talk with House Speaker Keller Barra. Talk a little bit about history. Talk about his election plans for the future. Talk about the regular session. Talk politics. All the good stuff we always get into. Look, as always, Speaker Barra got his Capital Gains Yeti. Last month, it was Mayor President Joel Robito. Y'all remember that show? Let's take a look at Joel Robito's cooler right now. Very, very nice. Look, before we go, I want to show y'all something. This is a duck decoy, not just any duck decoy. We talked about history today, so I'm going to talk about a historical figure, too. I picked this up at an auction. It's Harry Lee's, Sheriff Harry Lee, Jefferson Parish, the Chinese cowboy. It's going to go in my collection of uh, Louisiana political memorabilia. Next month, we're going to do it all over again. We're going to have a new guest. We're going to give away the Capital Games Yeti Cooler, maybe talk about some history. So until then, keep your ethics compliance, your war chest full, and your politics wild and ambitious. Louisiana has a rich history of exporting to the world, jazz, food, the laissez-faire way of life. Now, Louisiana has a new export, America's natural gas. Over the last two years, more than 200 cargoes of liquefied natural gas from Sabine Pass have been delivered to more than two dozen countries on five continents. And each one can say, made in Louisiana. Chenier Sabine Pass LNG facility in Cameron Parish is the first large-scale facility of its kind in the United States. We are the largest single physical purchaser of natural gas in America. And we're only getting started. By 2020, Chenier expects to be a top five global supplier of LNG. In Louisiana, more energy exports means more jobs created here at home. 
Our Sabine Pass facility directly created more than 5,000 construction jobs at our peak and now supports 500 new permanent jobs and hundreds of permanent contractors. We've created more than $11 billion in economic activity and 25,000 indirect jobs since beginning construction in 2012. The exports from this one facility in Southwest Louisiana are expected to reduce the nation's trade deficit by $7 billion annually. We are proud to build and operate in Louisiana because this state reflects our values and our commitment to our communities further embodies the true spirit of Louisiana. Chenier's success is Louisiana's success. It means more jobs, more U.S. natural gas sent around the world, and more opportunities for a better Louisiana.